I figured I'd try out a new format where I go over some of the more interesting tech news that happened in the previous week that wasn't enough to make a whole video about, but there's quite a bit that usually happens every week I like to talk about, and it's not always the biggest news. Some of this stuff is kind of small, but still interesting and good to know about. That's the kind of stuff that I'd like to talk about. This is gonna be the first week of it, and let me know what you guys think. First off, Android users are gonna love this. Android is finally getting an equivalent to Apple's Find My Network, where it doesn't use GPS if you're trying to find a lost device necessarily. It can also use people just walking by, and if they have an Android phone using a relatively recent version, it will connect via Bluetooth and then report back and be able to tell people anonymously that their device is around this vicinity. It's not gonna be just for devices. Of course, they're also gonna be supporting basically AirTag-like things where it's for items and probably third-party form factors. Like there's actually card ones now for the iOS, not just the AirTags, quite a bit. Google also said that for some of the more recent ones, specifically like the Pixel 8, devices, it will be able to still detect using the network even if the phone is turned off or offline or even if the battery's dead, they said. I don't know how that works. Maybe it uses like NFC or RFID or something like that. I'm gonna have to look more into that. They didn't really talk about that in the announcement very much. Next up, for those of you in the United States, you should be happy to know that ISPs, internet service providers, now are not gonna have as easy of a time to shove in hidden fees and all this crap because the FCC now requires that ISPs show a nutrition label for their plans. And it really does look like that. It was kind of like inspired by the requirements for food nutrition labels. You can see that it has required information for all plans that they offer, such as the introductory price versus the regular pricing, if the price is gonna go up, additional fees, data allowances, which is a big one, and also upload and download speeds. A lot of times, plans will kind of hide the upload speed because it sucks compared to the download speed. I looked at a couple internet service providers I know and it does look like they already show it and it's not hidden away either. There's the requirement that it has to be like pretty apparent. So right on the normal page where they show you all the possible plans you can get, I think it's on those same pages, at least the ones that I saw, and I think it's required to be. Now, does that mean that everyone is gonna understand what they're looking at? Maybe not necessarily, but at least if you do, it's a lot easier to figure out all the crap that they try to hide from you. Next, Microsoft released a registry tweak patch that you can choose to do yourself for a new vulnerability that was announced. You know that Spectre meltdown thing that was discovered uh, several years ago? Well, apparently there's a new variant of it and there is a way to mitigate it that Microsoft released in the form of like two registry keys that you can add and on their official site, they have like two commands that you can put into an elevated command prompt to add those. I personally did, but it's not gonna be added as a default Thing. You have to choose to go and do it. I think because probably it might not be quite as severe. I think it has like a four point something severity rating out of 10. And also it potentially could have a performance hit sort of like how the mitigations did back with the original Meltdown and Spectre. So I will put a link in the description to Microsoft's official blog post about this vulnerability and you can see they have instructions with the registry keys if you just wanna copy that into a command prompt running as admin. I did, I haven't really noticed a huge difference, but there might be a performance hit. You can choose whether or not you want to add it. Also having to do with security, apparently hackers are creating completely malicious GitHub repos that target basically the search function and I think are mostly made to either mimic a legitimate project that might not be popular, but someone might find it and kind of clone it, or it could be like a clone of a popular project and when someone goes to search for it, it'll have like fake stars that were botted, so it looks more legitimate. And then if a developer goes and clones it and tries to use it in a project, it has code that will be launched by the IDE and potentially infect you. So always important, just because something is open source doesn't mean that it's not malicious because it could be a completely malicious repo in the first place. So always try to verify that you're on the official correct page for a project and don't just go by stars because they can be faked. 
Next up, we're about to see even larger SD cards coming out. Western Digital announced that this year they're gonna be releasing two terabyte SD cards and in 2025, four terabyte SD cards. These actually comply with a new standard for SD card speed classes. I didn't actually know this until now. Basically, you know how there's speed ratings that might be on an SD card, it says like V30, V90, stuff like that. There's a new one called SD Express, and these speed classes go all the way up to 600 megabytes plus. And of course, the SD card might be faster than the maximum speed rating. These are just ones they created as a standard. Apparently, the higher speed ones are only gonna be 128 or 256 gigabytes, whereas the bigger ones that I talked about are probably gonna be like a slower speed class. But Western Digital is not the only game in town. Samsung also announced SD Express cards that are capable of one gigabyte plus, depending on whether it's read or write. So new, very fast SD cards coming out. Of course, you would require a device that supports the latest standard to be able to use that. And probably not that many people need that kind of speed. It's mostly gonna be probably for professional cinema cameras that are recording like RAW or 8K, that sort of thing. But still always gonna be nice to have faster stuff available as an option. This next one got me really excited. Adobe announced new generative AI features coming to Adobe Premiere Pro, which I use every day for editing these videos. And they're basically gonna allow you to kind of do like Photoshop for videos where you can either select part of a video and tell it to generate something to replace that with, and it'll do it sort of like with Photoshop's current generative fill that they have. It'll be for video now, or it'll also have features for extending a clip. So if you have an existing clip, you just want to be a bit longer, you can use AI to do that, generate more length, or you'll even be able to generate entirely new clips as B-roll that don't have an initial reference. So you really have all the options here, but what's very interesting is in addition to supporting some of the existing AI video services like Pika Labs and Runway ML. They said they are also going to partner with OpenAI and their Sora model, which in my opinion is by far the best one, really the only one that's probably worth using professionally. And really we have not seen this as an option for anyone to actually use. And apparently these features in Adobe Premiere Pro are gonna be coming out later this year. So that'll be very interesting to see, do they kind of neuter the Sora model for this or will it be the full-fledged feature set, we'll have to see. This next one is pretty neat. Dyson announced a upcoming feature where it'll be able to use augmented reality on your phone to basically track where you've already vacuumed. You guys might remember several months ago, there was a video that kind of went viral of someone who did this as like a concept, or I think they might've done it with their Vive headset. They set it up where it would do just that. It would show you exactly where you've already vacuumed and a lot of people obviously like that and I guess Dyson decided they wanted to do that and it'll apparently be launching in June only for their most recent uh, model at the moment, which is the Gen 5 Detect stick vacuum. And I, I'm assuming they're gonna be launching it for future vacuums because it doesn't actually hook up to the vacuum itself, I believe. I think it just, it mounts on a thing that attaches to the tube and then you use the Dyson app and it, just kind of tracks it. So I don't see why that would be limited to just one model, but they might artificially limit it. We'll have to see. I'm probably gonna see if I can use it. Next up, Intel is apparently finally investigating some issues that have been reported in the newest generation Intel i9 3900 and 4900K processors with some games where it would either crash the games or have errors like invalid or insufficient memory that some people were seeing. And apparently this was causing a big amount of returns, especially in Korea, because one of the games that was affected was Tekken 8. I guess that's relatively popular or newly launched. And apparently they're getting like 10 CPU returns per day. So finally they're taking a look and seeing, okay, this could be an issue because I guess it's just for these specific models. Apparently other games are also affected, mostly having to do with the Unreal Engine. So that would include stuff like Fortnite, but also other games like Overwatch. So I'm assuming this is gonna be some kind of thing they can patch out if they figure it out. They don't want people returning the CPUs. Hopefully it's not architectural. Finally, the PS5 Pro specs have been confirmed. It's gonna be apparently released 
released before the holidays of this year. And we have some information finally. It's going to apparently have a GPU that's about 45% faster than the current regular PS5. It's gonna have a 28% increased memory bandwidth. And apparently the CPU is going to be the same, but it's gonna have an increased clock speed of about 10%, so we'll be improved there. And also it's supposed to have improved ray tracing architecture that supposedly will be able to be up to four times faster for ray tracing purposes. So how much that actually translates to real world performance, we'll have to see. But also interesting is the PS5 Pro will have a new super resolution, I guess it's using AI, called PlayStation Spectral Super Resolution. I think this is gonna be kind of like DLSS with NVIDIA. So this will allow the console to create higher resolution output that looks natively at that resolution, but without having to use as much GPU power. Apparently they're targeting 4K 60 or 8K 30 performance. And I've read that they're planning to target 4K 120 for future generations of consoles. So even though I believe the PS5 and PS5 Pro are capable of outputting at 4K 120, that's not really what this is targeting, but theoretically, depending on the game, it could be possible to get to that level. So yeah, those are some interesting tech news stories from the past week. Let me know which was your favorite, and if I missed something, of course, let me know down in the comments, and let me know what you think of this series in general. If you wanna keep watching, the next video I'd recommend is where I went over 17 computer tips that you'll wish you knew sooner. Those are pretty good. I'll put that link right there and click on. So thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.